Uh, we're going to start uh, with Al Rotz. Uh, Al is uh, our first speaker, has worked in this area for many years. Al is an agricultural engineer with the USDA ARS, Agricultural Research Service. He has served since 1997 as the lead scientist for Integrated Farm Systems Project at the Pasture Systems and Watershed Management Research Unit at University Park <coughs> for ARS. So Al, glad to have you with us and uh, uh, it's all yours. Hey, thanks, Rick. Well, uh, you know, the sustainability of beef, as, as Rick kind of indicated, it's, it's been sort of a, a growing uh, topic. Uh, NCBA has gotten involved, and, and I've kind of gotten involved with them. So the past couple of years, we've been collaborating on a project for assessing the sustainability of beef. Some co-authors, collaborators on this project uh, Tom Bataglis is with uh, BASF Corporation, and they've been involved with some of the life cycle assessment. And Kim Stackhouse Lawson is formerly with NCBA, uh, now with JBS. Most of you know in this room that, that beef has not uh, gotten the best reputation when it comes to sustainability, and many have labeled it as unsustainable. And this has kind of led to this project, of course, with NCBA, we wanted to really get some good scientific information on assessing and quantifying the sustainability of beef. What is sustainability? Uh, everybody has a different definition, I guess. Everybody's talking about it. Nobody really knows what they're talking about. But in general, it, it comes down to something like this, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And more specifically, the beef industry has defined sustainability uh, as meeting the growing demand for beef by balancing environmental responsibility, economic opportunity, and social diligence. So one aspect of that, of course, is carbon footprint. And that's what everybody tends to want to focus on. And it's what has gotten the most attention in the past, say, five to 10 years. That's just really a very small component of sustainability. But we will be talking about that today, and I will be showing you some numbers on it. When we look at sustainability, it's usually categorized in these three major categories. We have environmental issues, economic issues, and social issues. And what I'll be focusing on today is this environmental section. You can see within each of these, we can break it down into subcategories. Right here under environmental, we have air emissions. So greenhouse gas emissions is one part of this, along with ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, VOCs, and a lot of other things. We also have water emissions, of course, uh, water use, energy use, a lot of things that have to be factored in to really quantify sustainability. So you can see it gets to be uh, fairly complex. Plus, we're working with a very complex biological system perhaps one of the most complex that have been uh, where LCA uh, type quantification of sustainability has been applied. We're looking at the whole system from cow-calf clear through to the consumer and the waste provided, produced by the consumer, as well as all the resources that go into each of those components as we track the system. So to do this, the tool that we use is life cycle assessment, LCA. Uh, it's an accounting procedure, basically, that just pulls together a, a lot of da data on the inputs and outputs of the system to do, uh, to, to really come up with quantifiable numbers on sustainability. So many inputs and outputs must be measured. And bottom line is the LCA is only as good as the data that you're using to feed it in. It, it in itself is not a model, it's not predicting, it's not, it's just pulling together the data that you feed in, so. Bad data in, bad data out. Good data in, good data out, hopefully. So that's where we come in, we're trying to quantify these inputs and outputs as best we can. We did an initial assessment a, a couple years ago starting, uh, we did it uh, based around the production system at the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center in Clay, uh, Clay Center, Nebraska. Uh, this is an ARS facility, if you're not familiar with it. It shows some of the specs on it. They have a fairly sizable beef herd. Uh, 
it's somewhat representative of, of what's being done uh, throughout the country, but of course it was a very specific herd that we were looking at. And we did do a full LCA on that, uh, around that production system uh, in collaboration with the ASF. But now we've moved, we've moved on and we really are looking at the full United States to do this. We've divided it into these seven regions and we're working through region, one region at a time. So at this point, we have completed studies for the southern and northern plains, the Midwest, uh, the southwest and northwest. We're currently working in the southeast and hope to finish the northeast later this year. So what we do, uh, we, for each of the regions, we go in and we just try to learn as much as we can about the production practices of that region, because it does vary a lot. I'm sure you're aware as you move across the country, things are done differently. So within each region, we want to look at how things are done. We model representative operations in that region. And from that modeling work, then we develop the, the data that, that's needed for the LCA. More specifically, what we do, uh, we start out with an online survey that's distributed throughout the region to producers. And we work with the beef councils in the states to help encourage and, and, and get the producers to fill out this survey. And this just gives us some <clears throat> information on, on, on their production practices. We, we purposely try to keep the survey simple, you know, a 15 minute type survey, nothing that they would have to go to their files and pull out numbers and that sort of thing. We just want to know how do you do things. So there's two surveys, what we call the ranch survey is basically more the, the, the grass-based pasture type systems, cow-calf, stocker, uh, and it can be cow-calf clear through to finish. And then the feedlot survey is primarily feedlots uh, or barns where they're being fed in confinement. In addition, we visit about 20 ranches and, and, and maybe half as many feedlots or finishing operations in each region. During that visit, we collect a lot of the same kind of information that will be in the survey, plus we get some more detailed information now, numbers that they would have to pull out, um, things like energy use, pesticide use, and some things like that. We'll get some numbers on that. So we're not necessarily getting a random selection, but in, 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 the, in the whole process, we're just really trying to get a good sampling of, of whatever's being done out there, small operations to large operations and different management practices. So from this then, uh, the, from the information gathered, we set up these representative operations, we simulate them on the computer, and, uh, and that gives us the data for the LCA. Uh, we, within the systems too, I should point out that we include calves and call animals from the dairy industry as well. That's all part of the beef production system. So we're including those systems as well. So the model we're using is the integrated farm system model. This is a model that's been under development, I guess, pretty much all my career. Uh, it's been applied widely to, to beef and dairy systems uh, across the country and in some other parts of the world. What's kind of unique about this model is that it's, I guess, the level of detail and the number of processes that it includes. We're really trying to represent the, the whole farm here. Uh, not only the animals and the crops, but the harvesting, preservation, the handling of the manure, and so forth. We usually simulate these systems over 25 years of weather to get sort of a long-term look at the performance. We also include economics in this, including economic analysis. And as indicated here, we're looking at all the inputs and outputs, all the emissions that are occurring uh, from each of the components as we simulate them through time. So that gives us the data that we need up to the farm gate where the cattle are leaving for uh, slaughter. We are also working with packers, case-ready processors, and restaurants in, in gathering close farm gate information. We combine them together and, and, and do the full LCA with a, with a different tool, a life cycle assessment tool. Uh, there's two tools that we've been working with. As I mentioned in the initial in assessment, we were working with BASF using their eco-efficiency tool we're now in this regional assessment. It, we'll be working with the, the University of Arkansas and the, the SEMA Pro tool. 
So with that, I'm going to go through some of the results that we have so far. Uh, it's not complete, but yet what, you, what you're seeing is probably pretty representative of what we'll get at the final product. I uh, won't be showing you a lot of numbers, but, but some figures and things to kind of give you a feel for, for what, we got, what we're getting. There are a lot of numbers. Uh, for the farm gate results, the major things I'm going to be showing you here are the greenhouse gas emissions or the carbon footprint, reactive nitrogen loss, which is just the total reactive nitrogen that's being lost from all sources and all forms in the production cycle, fossil energy use, and non-precipitation water use. So this is a look at the uh, carbon footprints now of that, that we're finding for the different for production systems in each region, okay? And for the most part, if you can see, the, the black numbers are the means, and the red numbers are the range that we are finding for, for specific representative production systems in each region. So you can see in each region, we have a pretty broad range. The means are not too different. We have a little high, it's a little higher in the Midwest, due to the more humid climate and greater use of fertilizer and lime and some things like that than what we would find in the West. Fairly low number here in, in the Southwest compared to the other regions and the major reason for that is uh, the large number of dairy cattle <coughs> being fed into the beef system in this region. And dairy cattle, ca particularly calves from, from the dairy industry don't have a very high footprint, say, as they come into the production system as compared to one that's being produced in a cow-calf system. So anyhow, that, that brings that number down some. Maybe the more interesting thing is how do these things break down? Uh, you see about 60% of the footprint comes from the animal, enteric production. Uh, 5% for manure, we have 18% for feed production. Anthropogenic CO2 here is pretty small, but that's what's from the combustion of fossil fuels, tractors, trucks, ATVs, that sort of thing. The 13% here that's labeled as pre-chain, these are the emissions that are occurring as a, they produce resources that are being used in the system. Fertilizer, fuel, again, electricity, that sort of thing. This is a look at the reactive nitrogen. About half of the reactive nitrogen comes from ammonia emissions, and that's split uh, roughly 50-50, I guess, between the feedlot and pasture. So there's quite a bit of ammonia coming off the pasture, too. We tend to think of the feedlot as being the, the major source, but not necessarily. Uh, another, what, 22% from nitrate leaching, 23% from N2O, denitrification, nitrification, uh, processes. 1% from combustion, very little, and 6% pre-chain. Look at the fossil energy use. In this case, most of that is actually falling into pre-chain category. So it's being used in the production of resources that are being used in the system, rather than actually used on by the, uh, in the system. We do have about uh, about 25% or so that's being used, uh, actually it's a little more, almost 30%, I guess, right within the operation uh, for fuel combustion, here for facilities, that's mostly electricity use. For non-precipitation water use, you can see by the number here that it varies greatly. So 200 in the Midwest, 12,000 in the West, uh, most, I mean, it's all pretty much irrigation of, of cropland for producing feed. 84% uh, here is labeled as pre-chain, but this is all producing feed that's being purchased and brought in to uh, feed primarily on the feed lot. And another 12% that's actually irrigated crops on the particular operations. So if we're relatively small, around 4% or less is actually being consumed by the animals. So that's up to the farm gate. Now if we take it the rest of the way through the cycle, including transportation, the packer, the processor, the retail, consumer, and the waste produced by the consumer. Now the carbon footprint is being expressed per pound of consumed beef. The number goes up 
pretty much doubles. Yes, again, the interesting thing is well, how does it break down? So we see about 60% here comes from grazing cattle. Another, there's 15% plus, most of this 13%, or I guess the 13%, most of the 15% goes into uh, feedlot finishing. Really about 10% here is for the consumer and the restaurant uh, consumption. Relatively small numbers for packer and, and case ready retail. I'm not going to go through all these, we just don't have time to really focus on, on these too much, but this is a list of the, all the metrics that we've worked with so far in quantifying the sustainability. Uh, and this is just a, a look at how they break down again across these different components. So from this end, it's feed production, cow-calf, feedlot, harvesting, case-ready, retail, consumer, and restaurant. I guess the, the, it would take a while to just so, kind of sit down and study this to get a lot out of it. But the m most important point that I want to point out here is that we could go through all these metrics. Cattle production really dominates. That's where most of the, uh, the problem lies, I guess. <coughs> if we want to mitigate, if we want to reduce, improve the sustainability, that's really where we have to focus on. There's a few exceptions here, like ozone depletion potential and solid waste, uh, where some of the other parts of the system dominate. That said, uh, what is the major loss in sustainability? Uh, you know, looking over all of it, well, I mean, I, I, what usually gets the attention is enteric production by the animal. And I guess if you're focused strictly on carbon footprint, you know, that's, that's up there. But really, the major thing is food waste. And most of that is at the consumer level. We're wasting 20 to 30% of our food, beef, milk, whatever. That's what, that's what we waste. And when you waste 20%, let's say, of, of the food that's being produced, that increases every metric that you can use to measure sustainability by 20%. So nothing else has that kind of impact because it just impacts everything in the whole system leading up to that. So in conclusion, uh, cattle production is the major contributor to most of the metrics, as we saw, if you want to quantify sustainability. And within cattle production, really grazing cattle, the cow-calf system uh, actually carries uh, a lot of the contribution so there are opportunities to mitigate environmental impacts uh, throughout the life cycle of beef, uh, but the largest opportunities would, op would really be in working more with the cattle production end. As you saw, it's a fairly small contribution from once the cattle uh, leave the, the operation and go through processing. And finally, the consumers do have a role too, as we just saw. Because food waste is just really a major impact on the, on the final uh, life cycle assessment of sustainability. Thank you. We have time for a question or two. For Al. <laughs> As far as carbon footprint, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, ours aren't much different than what anybody else has shown. And the, I mean, especially on carbon footprint, I mean, like you say, enteric fermentation is sort of, I mean, is there an opportunity there? It seems hard to tackle. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's plenty of opportunity, uh, very difficult, but. I mean, things are being done that, okay. looking at feed additives and things like that, that can, that can provide some substantial reduction. Is it California that has the, I guess, mandate for dairy for methane production? Yeah. 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 I mean, I know it's not quite along the line. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, but. Yeah. 
Larry says yes. Did we have another question over here? Yeah. Uh, within the, the, um, the cattle system, you said grazing had a big part. Um, I didn't quite catch it. What, what's the relationship or the comparison between the grazing and the feed production the, uh, uh, within that? Uh, within yeah. that category of, of, of cattle production, you said it was dominated by, by, by the feeding production. How much of that is grazing? And, and is that, I thought you said that was a big part, but it seems like feeding, the feed production is also a big part. Yes, I, I guess, I mean, the grazing part of it is, is, is a major part. I guess when you look at the full life cycle of the animal, okay, you have a cow and one twentieth of a bull basically living on the pasture for a full year to produce one calf. And then that, that calf is on pasture. If it's a stalker operation, they're on pasture most of their life too. And then they're on the, the feedlot finishing for a fairly short time okay. you know, on the full life cycle. So when you put that all together, that's why the grass-based portion of the, of the life cycle okay. tends to dominate. So that, that, that uh, we'll, long we're going to need to move on here for our next speakers to preserve the time. So uh, Al, thank you very much for the presentation. Let's uh, show our appreciation.